Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Caroline MacDonald. I am the CEO and founder of Ogadoon. Now, last night I was reading through my blurb that was on the agenda, and I was a little bit worried because the words that we wrote a few months ago didn't sit well with me or what we're about. The intention was still the same, and I intend to do that today, but setting fire to your industry or words like that, when you're an environmental scientist by academia and by trade, really uncomfortable for me during the night. And I couldn't understand why until I woke up this morning. And that's because although we think we've got a disaster happening around us with the politicians, the biggest disaster has happened, which is a massive fire in South America. Collectively, we actually don't know what that impact is going to be at the moment because it's going to be subtle and indirect. It is colossal what has happened over there. And I often, I wondered this morning, in terms of things that have happened in South America, maybe Amazon could help out the Amazon. Can you slice off maybe 0.2% of his wealth to fundamentally help that ecosystem? Because at the bottom of everything, ecosystems drive the economy. For, um, for anything like this, so what the reason why I've come to this that point is the fact that I'm here to talk to you about how you can get communications, get your tech business going, how you communicate, is that I thought the intention was still right, but the words weren't wrong. So I had to rethink about that. And it's all about adjustment. And tech does have a role in the environment, as Richard's just outlined for it. How many of you are doing your thing to help prevent more sustainable damage at home? How many of you do at work? How many of you are actually doing something about the climate strike at work? What are you doing at work? Uh, well, it is my work. <laughs> OK, if that's fine. Uh, is there anybody else who doesn't do that sort of thing, doing that sort of stuff at work? Yeah. Um, I go to the school to the Cool. Anybody else? It is easy to do, and you know what? Tech can do its part. You don't have to go out and do a beach clean. You don't have to go out and plant trees. You can do, you can go to the conservationists. But if you're all coders and people who are really skilled in tech, why not lend a hand to those that are trying to get their voice across? Indeed, why not be that true Hollywood hackathon and actually tap into maybe Trump's personal data and get those things blaring up at him? Because behind any of the greenwash, any of the propaganda from climate deniers, to climate change believers, is science. And science is linked to data, as Richard outlined. If you look at the data that is being bought by the governments around the world, of the chief scientific advisors, you will find that things are happening. It's been happening for a while, and some of it is irretrievable. So go behind all that and do your thing for the climate strike, if you can help in some way. Make the tech do good. There's an awful lot of tech that can do good. Why can't you be part of it? <coughs> because for most of us in the tech world, we talk a different language. We talk about code. For a lot of people, code is poetry. It's art. It's beauty in its way. With one of our clients who, are, uh, who do simulation, I've never seen people get so excited when they're on the glass wall writing out bits of code and what that means to them. And this code engenders change. It's certainly at the cornerstone of most of our business, isn't it now? About how we live and work, how society is. But how can you sell it? Obviously, communicating code to code actually does the stuff, you know, if you look at uh, the, the basis of the World Wide Web, that's code to code talking to each other. It makes your tech happen, makes your tech unique. And you probably find that you get that tech breakthrough when coders collaborate and when they unite. But does it actually sell? Code doesn't sell. We as humans actually sell. It's human to human stuff. 
So we need to communicate in ways that our recipients that we want to get excited about our tech will actually listen so that they change their, their thinking. They actually get attracted and then they're actually predispositioned to purchase. So you need to get talking. And most people that I speak to who are in tech businesses, they don't particularly like talking. They don't particularly like communicating. They like their coding or their tech to do their work for them. The art of communication is just that. There is an art to it. Most of us get it wrong quite a lot of the time, just in daily conversations with people, um, how we maybe put something up on the internet in terms of a social post. How many times have you purchased something from a brand and been disappointed because how it's been communicated to you and how you are uh, satisfied by it are two different things? How often does it not work properly? Who finds themselves shouting? I don't know, Alexa? Sat nav, because it's not listening? Maybe the blank computer screen, because it's not working, even we've switched it on and off. For any business to be successful, <coughs> you have to communicate. You have to communicate to survive, and you have to communicate to thrive. Through good times, also through hard times. But it's not all about having the big money bags. You don't need stacks of cash. The beauty about tech is that in this digitized world, it's easier and cheaper to communicate and to get your tech sold, particularly post the millennium bug when we had all those instances when everything was going to fall down. Even though it's easier and cheaper, in some ways, it's actually harder as well. How much noise do you get coming at you? in lots of different ways. If you think about how much you see on your phone, it's great to be here because we're not seeing our phone, we're not being slave to it. What do you get coming at you all the time? How much of it is really meaningful to you? How much do you want to hear, whether that's at work or at home, or whatever? <laughs> it's challenging. There's so much content being published that the risk and reality that your brand voice won't be heard is quite strong. Over 75% of content that's published online is not engaged with. So just think about how much you put out as yourself, but also what your business might put out. The good news is that there are some simple rules to follow to get this right. The bad news, you can avoid the bad news by not getting distracted from your business objectives. There are so many times when people come to me saying, I need my business to go viral. Good luck with that. That won't occur because you've planned it. That occurs through a set of circumstances that you can't control. So here are the rules. Authenticity. Number one, you need to be authentic about what you do and your tech. What's your idea? Why is it different? But more, to, more to the point, why should people care? You have to pass that don't care element to it. It can be used a bit more rudely if we wish to. This is your most important business part to your business. You might care. You might think it's the most amazing bit of tech that you're coming up with. But you've got to stand away from that and think, why should anybody else? Robustly challenge yourself. If you think it's a good idea, test it. Um, test it elsewhere. Test it a little bit more. How many times have you heard somebody go, oh, with the Uber of X, Y, and Z? <coughs> oh, we've got an Airbnb model, but it's different for this, this, and this. Is it really? Do you really want to be an Uber or something else? Forget the innovation tag. I hear so much about people saying we're innovative. How, why, it's, it's, how can you prove it? Authenticity that is truly grounded is your gold dust. And you have to be quite challenging to yourself to um, ensure that you have that authenticity. Second one is about clarity. What are you saying to people? Why does it matter to them? What is your brand's point of view? What are you trying to solve? Where are you in the marketplace compared to everybody else? Are you actually trying to carve out a new niche marketplace? 
that's really hard going, but it can be done because people have done it. Taken an idea and flipped it, changed it. How niche are you going to be? Are you going to be deep niche? How will your recipients, i.e. your customers, your consumers, your influencers, your investors, <coughs> going to receive and understand your offer? But most of all, why would they buy? If you're not clear in your message, who's going to get it? Third one, consistency. You've worked out your messages, your calls to action, your elevator pitch, your strap line, your telltale sell content, your brand recognition, your brand values, your brand behavior. If you keep chopping and changing, people won't know what they're buying or what you're about. A bit like friendships. If you've got that friend that keeps chops and changing, after a while you just move on from it. It's going to be the same for your brand and your technology because people need to build that relationship. <coughs> At the heart, Although you might be selling your product or service, and it may have the best coding in the world, the most original idea, ultimately, you're selling human to human. Behavior, perception, cognition, always comes into this. You can look at the 80-20 Pareto's rule if you wish to. We always go on that 80% is the relationship that you have, 20% is the actual stuff. Because that 80% gets you over when that bit of stuff doesn't work or is superseded in some way. So you get brand loyalty. If you're not consistent in your messaging about your business, <coughs> you won't gain momentum, have a strong lead pipeline, or develop a fan base or referral network. Remember the human connection. Referral network is the cheapest form of marketing, as we all know. If you engage in your fan base, they will advocate and do your hard work for you. Use the human connection to your advantage. And don't forget, it takes multiple exposures to your business and to your brand before somebody actually understands and might actually get with it. If you're looking at a B2B circumstance where you're selling into lots of different people, you're going to have to sell into lots of their different points of views, and that's going to take time. But they need that consistency to come through. <coughs> Ultimately, you want to make sure that you can be readily recalled and recognized. Don't change your call, just change your window dressing on it. Fourth, you need to be continuous. Do you want your competitors to take your airspace? If you're not continually out there, not in an aggressive way, but consistently continually out there, telling people about yourself, you'll be uppermost in their mind. If you're not, somebody else is going to occupy that bit because we've only got so much. There's only so much that we read scrolling through on social or read in the press or get referred to. You need to make sure that you're always in there and you're continuous with it. And it could be practical like your Google rankings or your PPC, or it could be actually the recall element in your customer's mind, so how you're positioning it continually. It's easy to get crowded out, and it's easy to get forgotten if you're not continuous. A lot of businesses, particularly tech, will take the mind's eye off of this because they're either going to fundraise recruit or they're in deep negotiations with uh, a big deal. Chances are if you switch the tap off in terms of how you're communicating is it won't help any of those three things because your Google check has to stand up. The Google check has to go beyond just having a basic website. Your Google check has to show engagement. What investor is going to come into you? Okay, your figure work might be fine. But if you're not looking to seem to be active and promoting yourself, Negativity creeps into the mindset of the thinking. Equally, if you're trying to recruit the best people, if you're not up on it, somebody else is, might be offering a bit less, but they could easily go for it. If it appears that the lights are off, your brand won't be attractive. You can easily keep the lights on. It doesn't take much. If nothing else, just schedule social posts in that are relevant to your business. <laughs> Lastly, content. Content can deliver you really good return on investment. You don't need shed loads of it. I've just said 75% isn't engaged with, that's published. So use it wisely. Use content that's relevant to your brand, but relevant to your marketplace in the way that your marketplace is going to listen to you. 
How you might want to perceive stuff isn't necessarily how your marketplace wants to, so you need to go out and test. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Make yours that 25% of content that is actually engaged with. Quite clever about this. Make sure your focus is, is on how much value you can get from putting the effort into that content, how you can maximize your return on investment. <coughs> How can it be used across different channels in different formats to bring home the return? And use effectively, this is an efficient approach to delivering big impact without the big budgets. Just keep it simple, keep it relevant, but keep it interesting. Budgets are always a bone of contention for most businesses. I don't know one that isn't, doesn't matter what size you are. You do need to, we're not talking about no budget here, we're talking about some, but you don't need to have it big. You just look at it cleverly. You have to put it in the right place with the great creative ideas behind it and follow those rules for it. We've often delivered significant campaigns on the back of just a couple of grand. You're not looking at 10, 15, 20, 50 grand if you want to. You can do it if you need to have that maximum you can actually start off quite small. As long as you're consistent and follows those rules, you'll start to get that momentum coming through. And that's where guerrilla marketing comes in. We're not the purveyors of it in terms of we didn't come up with the idea, it's what we pursue. <coughs> guerrilla marketing means telling your story in unexpected ways, in unexpected places, digital and online, paid for organic, whatever it is. But most of all, it's pervasive. It seeps in through the different ways of how you can do it. It's not looking at things in block formats or compartmentalized. It's looking at what works right for your business. You can look at press, PR, SEO, social, digital content, do some of it, all of it. But essentially, it's what's right for your business to set your industry light and your brand buzzing. <coughs> so to give you some examples, um, we've worked with Exeter City Futures. They are a smart city organisation uh, down the M5. Quite broad brush. They do a lot of different things, sustainability-wise, but also in terms of incubation, in terms of improving citizenship, making the uh, city the, the choice uh, destination of choice to stay in in the future with urbanisation. Um, challenge because they're broad brush is to identify key hooks that were relevant to the brand and the marketplace. So what should they be known for there? They cover everything, but you go out to marketplace, marketplace is a bit scattergun, they're not going to engage. So we focus on something that was on trend as well, and we hooked into something that mattered for the industry, which was about sustainable business. Sustainable being both the green, but sustainable as being financially astute. Pitch that in. This got leverage with the live BBC interview on the Victoria Derbyshire show. <clears throat> with multi-million um, live viewers, plus on catch-up and social. The result is that Exeter City Futures positioned an expert in that area, and the, they're now beginning to get project offers coming in, into their place, as well as funding offers to deliver on that. So although they're broad, we focus on something that was really trend and really current to them, and as a result, they've got the exposure that they want to the momentum behind their brand.